Um, so, yeah, like, like Mike was saying, uh, my parent, parents immigrated to uh, Australia in uh, 1972 and then Cyclone Tracy hit Darwin and uh, they saw that as an opportunity to um, see, see what Australia might bring to them in, in the sense of like an adventure. I mean, part of the reason why they came up here as well too was just to explore Australia and they saw Cyclone Tracy as an opportunity to um, uh, get away from Sydney, which was a beautiful city, but it was pretty much just an, another big city like Paris was as well too. So um, when the cyclone hit, they started up a demolition business um, just for something different to do and to also help with the cleanup. And part of what happened with that demolition business is when we were kids, we were playing in all, all of the rubble. And um, as you, you probably know, um, Cyclone Tracy hit on Christmas Eve of 1974. And so there were kids' presents just strewn all, all over the place. There's like little toy soldiers and twister games, which um, I made paintings about later on to allude to, to the cyclone. And I use the symbology of the twister game a fair bit in my work as well too. Um, and it's, it's really started uh, my love for, for digging through rubble, like going to op shops and going to the local archives, going to the museums, uh, talking to people who had lived there previously, talking to historians and just finding out like what, what was really beneath the layer of, of, of things, like, you know, what the different stratas were in Darwin. And so you can see that in a lot of the work here. So like I'm, I'm a mad collector. I'm, I'm always collecting like playing cards. I'm always op shopping or going to antique stores or on eBay, just buying bits and pieces. Um, a lot of it's got to do with um, specifically where I live in Darwin and Northern Territory, like early photographs and uh, newspapers and um, kitsch as well too. Um, and so I've got drawers and drawers and boxes of it, which um, I use after to recreate these, li these little narratives um, with things that I'm interested in. Um, so that's pretty, pretty much where I'm at with that work. I also trained as a, as a printmaker at, at Northern Territory University. Um, I was an undergrad there from 1987 till 1992 when I graduated. Um, and for many years after that, uh, some of the people in the printmaking department started off the Aboriginal printmaking workshops up there. Um, not a very imaginative name, um, but it was a, a really, really great place. And I, I got to work with some, some of um, Australia's greatest artists like Kitty Cantilla and R Rover Thomas and Queenie M McKenzie, and, and, you know, amongst some of them. And so I, training as a printmaker, I, after I left the university um, as, a, as a lecturer and as a printmaker, I started off my own business as well too. And I got more into screen printing then because I trained uh, primarily as an etcher and a lithographer. And so a lot of the paintings that you see on there too, they're informed by all the, the very flat colours. And a few people at the opening last night asked me how I get the colours so flat. And uh, I tried to emulate the fact that um, I, I do a lot of screen printing work and try to create those colours again too, um, to recreate the, the printing process in a, in a way too that you get in comic books. Um, another thing about Cyclone Tracy as well too is there was relatively not a great deal to do except for play in the rubble or I think there was like ABC television and there was one local channel as well too, NTD8. So that, as far as like that kind of entertainment, there wasn't a great deal to do. So my mum would take us to the back of uh, Jingle Shops, which is a local suburb, every Tuesday and she'd give us 20 cents or 50 cents, which bought a whole stack of comic books. And we'd go back in the caravan parks, which we'd move you know, periodically from one caravan park to the other around Darwin, um, depending on what sites they were working on at the time. And um, I, I would just practice drawing all the time. Um, I didn't really get on with my siblings very much. I spent a lot of time on my own. I'm probably still introverted in that way. Um, and so from an early age, I was just copying um, comic books because it's something that I noticed that both of my parents did as well too. They were both, they were both very, very creative, although they, they didn't encourage it at home. And I guess because they, you know, they wanted me to have better opportunities than, than to be an artist because they saw that as you know, not a good path to go down, I guess as well too. That was um, generational as well. Um, from, where, from their perspective, but you know, I, I stuck with it, and um, so that's, that's what's informed a lot of the other, the other pieces here as well too. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I think that the way that I prefer to do talks, now that I've just given everybody that little intro, is to, for people to ask questions, and then that will sort of like get the ball rolling. And sort of well, just with that, I mean, hmm. we, we, we've spoken a bit about it, but can you like discuss specifically this body of work? And I mean, there, there is two, <coughs> there, there's sort of two bodies of work here in, in terms of, you've got the assemblages, which is a really cool explanation you have for those. But with these bigger ones, can you, I mean, it's, it, 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 
it would appear quite obvious what the images are. Mm -hmm. But I know from talking to you that there's layers upon layers upon layers of, of narrative behind it. Can you talk, even if you want to talk specifically to some of the paintings? Sure. Well, um, I guess like growing up with comic books too, I was, I was really aware that they were really directed at, at um, boys and young men as well too. And although that there were female characters uh, within the comic books, so they were never really the protagonists, other than in despair and not really empowered and not sort of from that kind of perspective. And, and I don't speak on behalf of being a feminist or anything else, you know, because clearly I'm male, and, you know, like, and I mean, I can only speak about the things that I've experienced or witnessed myself. And so I was wondering what, what it would look like to have the females as protagonists in, in all of these particular images just for a change. Um, just stories that I've heard from, you know, girlfriends, lovers, um, my mum, aunties, sisters, and just like relaying those stories back um, within the narrative as well too, with some of these pictures. Um, and, and also like playing around with, with different think more contemporary subjects as well too, like um, this uh, picture here, like um, No More Eggplant. So, you know, I, I grew up when we had dial-up telephones and internet was like, what's that? That's never going to take off. You know, that's just like such a strange concept. And now every, everybody's communicating with emojis. And I guess, uh, you know, apart from the, the, the sense of humour and the, the right sense of humour and that, whatever's going on in, in that narrative, it's, it's about that juncture between the, the two technologies um, that, I've, that I've witnessed gr growing up over a period of time and, and the way that we communicate as well too. So... The, the obvious narrative in there is a joke and a pun, but it's, it's also about that transition of yeah, how, how we speak to each other these days. And then I was looking at different kinds of relationships as well too that people are more open uh, to talk about as well too, like lesbian relationships, like in this one here, Sofo and Erina. Um, so I just assumed that Chuchu might be Sofo, Sofo and she's waiting for Erina to talk up, which is a famous uh, watercolour painting from 1864 by a guy called uh, Simon Simeon, who was a pre-Raphaelite artist, uh, a, a gay pre-Raphaelite artist who was talking about these sorts of things which um, got him into a bit of trouble and he ended up dying in poverty um, for being outspoken about those things. But Sappho was a, uh, a, um, a poet from ancient Greece who was writing a poem about how she might be able to entice Aphrodite to make her girlfriend kiss her. Um, and she was a poet on the uh, island of Lesbos and um, I was interested in that as well too because my mum split up from my, my father um, probably about 15 years ago and she moved to Paris with her girlfriend as well too. So, and for us that was like, oh okay, as long as you're happy. But it just talks about different kinds of relationships as well too. Um, yeah, and this one here as well too, like with the, 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 the Tinder diagrams, you know, and the one there, like you look a lot like my next mistake, the, the Tinder surprise in the back there. Um, I had a relationship break up a few years ago after being in a long-term relationship for about 15 years and we were with some friends at a party and he was saying, you know, we'd had, we'd had a couple of beers and he was going, oh, you should get on Tinder, mate. And I said, no, oh, I don't know, it's not my kind of thing, you know, it's like, that's for all like, that, you know, I don't do that. Like, I actually like dates and coffee and, you know, like just slowly. And he goes, no, no. So we're trying to work out like a tin how, to work it, how to work Tinder and we're swishing through and there's guys there with little kittens and puppies and I'm kind of going... Yeah, that's a bit. <laughs> it's like, it was just a strange experience. And he said, what, do you, what should you put in your profile? And I said, I oh, know, add to cart. And then after that, we'd have a few more beers. And we thought, no, that, that's not the way to go. But I'm just really fascinated in the way that we interact with different technologies and the way that we communicate these days is completely different. And because I guess like, through my, my own visual arts practice, that's what I'm trying to do all the time is to communicate ideas. So that's a very important part of it as well, too. So what's up with the um, with the, the ring of confidence? What I, I, the fact that you've actually crossed the ring out and um, and you've got, I mean obviously you know yeah. Colgate and the ring is that is yeah. the title. But yeah. what, what's that one about? Probably halitosis. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and he's he's struck out. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I think that date just ended then. Um, and, and, and often as well too, so like I'm, I'm, I'm broaching the thing of uh, the subject matter of having a look at new ideas like Tinder and new ways of communicating, but I'm also looking and harking back at um, things that I grew up with too. And it doesn't really matter if you, you, people now don't, don't get the illusions or the ideas that are behind it. I just do some things for myself sometimes as well too. I mean, when we first um, immigrated to Australia, um, I remember we we went out uh, where we were staying in the suburb and there was a little creek there and there was a corner shop. 
It's beautiful. I remember I ate Twisties for the first time in my life and I went, oh my God, this is amazing. And then followed by Freddo Frog and I thought, that is, that's so cool. And so those, those things about um, Australian popular culture and consumer culture have always stayed with me because um, at, at, a, at a young age, I sort of picked up on that. Um, all those sorts of things like the, the, the ads and, and all the rest of it. So I don't just make art for necessarily always a contemporary audience. Sometimes I slip bits and pieces in there that are just specifically for, you know, a nod and a wink to, to people who, who get those things from, from, from the past. Which leads to a, a, lot, of, a lot of these bits and pieces uh, in these works as well too. So this is a large assemblage that I did years and years ago. And you can see that was a leftover bit from a painting that I did of an assemblage. And that's the bottom of a uh, chicken twisty packet, which I cut out and put in there. Nothing goes to waste. Yeah, yeah. I just like the rightness of your placement yeah. of your yeah. pieces. And, and, and even then it's just like s just ever so slightly below there as well too, in, in order to create a little bit of tension. A little bit of tension. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like Matisse used to say about paintings, he'd say, I think one of his quotes was that uh, a painting should be like a comfortable ar armchair to some extent, but a comfortable archer, you, an armchair you would walk by every day. And those kind of paintings are beautiful to look at and they're, they're lovely objects, but they don't really niggle you. I think if something niggles you and you don't quite, doesn't sit quite comfortably with you, you're more likely to spend more time with it, you know, and go back to it and back to it again. So why is this, the, why am I, why is this particular object having this effect on me? And so like, I like to play with um, ideas of sort of like symmetry and then discord and disharmony and all that sorts of things playing with that as part, as, as part of like um, an aesthetic device as well too, as well as the colours and the objects and the shapes as well too. It all forms part of the um, near the compositional devices you can play around with. Frank, can I ask about the um, <coughs> Australia stencil? Where, where did it come from? Did it have any place in your childhood? Um, it, we had those uh, in primary school a long time ago yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so so that was that yours or have you just come upon one somewhere along the line i, I came upon one in um, a news agents that had like a dusty old box and i found a whole box of them so i, I bought all of them and um and i was doing a lot of uh imagery about years ago i did an exhibition from working with an artist in the, out in the kimberleys for many many years about the cattle industry up there you know through the view of the uh, indigenous people that, that were up there as well too and the wave hill walk-offs and so i was using these maps of australia uh, with a spray can and just spraying over the top of them just to get their silhouettes because they they mark themselves they work really good for that sort of thing and so this one's probably got a several layers of paint on it and then i found it in the in the cupboard and just thought i'll, I'll screw that on there now that's 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 served its purpose but if you go back i don't know maybe in the future if they have a, another retrospective you'll be able to see that exact map of australia on some of my earlier paintings as well too so everything ties back in so even though like i look for things like um uh in in an archaeological kind of way and trying to dig through strata to find other bits and pieces to work to to work through to create my work you'll find that within my own work as well too it's something that i reinform back into the Uh, absolutely. So these are leftovers for a, a painting that I sent over to Germany for for a group show uh, the year before last or last year, and so they're, they're just the leftover pieces. But with this piece here, so uh, bunk, um, and then bunk being crossed out was a uh, was a very um, it was a paper that uh, a British artist Eduardo Paralozzi uh, presented over in Scotland at the time uh, in the art school that it was that he was in. 
and from 1957, uh, 1947 to about, I think it was 52 or 54, he created a whole bunch of uh, collages, which were the, the bunk collages. And a lot of people cite that as the very first pop art. So uh, pop art didn't actually happen in America. Um, and Richard Hamilton, after another British artist after him followed, and then there was Pauline Body and Peter Blake who designed the Sergeant Pepper's uh, cover on the record. So all these artists were creating pop art before it became a phen phenomenon in America, but the, the Americans just made it bigger and better and you know, it's all about so that, that sort of a thing. But in, in reality, um, the, the artwork came from, um, I guess, pe people in Britain post-World War II living in austerity um, and having pretty much basically stuff all to live on. Um, you know, finding it difficult to find food and, and all the rest of it. And then they're looking at the Americans and their posterity and all the advertising that was coming over and all the music. And so out of that, that's, what, that's the context of how that, that artwork, that pop art actually became a thing to, to start off with. And then the Americans, after you get Liechtenstein and, and Warhol in the early 60s, having a look at that as well too, but from them actually living in amongst it and um, being insiders as opposed to being people on the outside looking at at all that um, prosperity. So that was all American and English. So, yep. but this is all. Yeah. Not. Yeah. So, um, Wendy Garden from um, Magnet, curator of our uh, contemporary art at Magnet, she did the opening last night, and she was talking about how I used the term "what if," and then through all these works here, I was also wondering what would I have done. What what kind of work would I have done if I was around in 1962 in Australia? Um, what kind of bits and pieces would I have put together and assemblages to create um, different narratives and different ideas? And, and a, lot of the, a lot of these as well too are just, um, then there are lots of bits and pieces that sort of like correlate together for ideas, a bit like in the same way that you would write a song or, or a poem. And so he, here's a picture of Hoag's here uh, from an Australasia Post magazine. That's also an actual article of a guy somewhere proud of his son chuffing on a dory. It's like, it's just crazy. But, but actually, Mike said, you said that you saw that exact same thing. I saw that magazine in my dad's That's why I stack of... have to get that because I think when I was about, I was around 10 or 11 years old, I actually saw that article yeah. in whatever publication. I saw that, that photo yeah. back yeah. in the 70s, early 70s. The son here was born. <laughs> 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 no, but I, I remember seeing that as, as yeah. a kid. I yeah. saw that actual um, yeah. that image. So, so pretty much like a haiku or a small poem. I start off with something, and it, it so it was just like hogs with a the gold packet, and then I thought gold, Winnie gold. So I just wrote the word gold in Scrabble, and then I found some. And th these are just loose pieces that I'm playing around with. And then I thought a packet of 20, so I had the number 20, I put that there. And then I thought gold, uh, the, atomic, the atomic weight for gold and the, the symbol on the periodic table, then the twisty packet, and then where there's fire, there's smoke. And so I just put smoke. And so these things just happen really, really quickly. It's just like, um, you know, beat poets, you know, you sort of like, you click your fingers and it's a very next word, or like rapping. It's a very next word that comes to your mind. To, you just grab that object and you put it down without too much thought, and then, then you can start tweaking the compositional devices a little bit more. Like even here, this, this watch from Dulux here just says true blue on it as well too. But that's a funny thing as well too, like about like identity as well too, and trying to figure out where, where I fit in as well too, like having a European heritage. You know, I don't consider myself French or Breton, which is where I was born and all my ancestors come from. Um, but it, it's, it's really funny. I always feel like I'm like a, an observer on the outside of everything that's going on. And that's probably part to do, to do with me um, being locked up in my studio for so, so much, you know, on my own as well too, just trying to be an observer of what's going on around me, listening to the news, listening to the radio, and trying to get those bits and pieces together to make commentary about that. Is, oh, I was going to say, is there a connection with the scores? Like you've got, like that's 15 there, and this one's 10 down here, well, that's 10. Yeah. But you've got that regularly through quite a few of these assemblages. Yeah, sure, so that one could be five, but, uh, or it could, it could just be like five and five, and then maybe another five somewhere else. Yeah. Off the edge of the picture plane as well too. 
and ones like the the Holden and Hold On are probably a little bit and Olden. This is like again, that's just a, a play with words as well too. But yeah. My, my question was, <coughs> I'm imagining in your studio these are all going on simultaneously. Are they, or are you doing them one at a time? Oh, they're all happening simultaneously. As, as are these paintings as well too. So when, when I have a series of paintings, they're just all lined up, leaning up against things, and some of them are put on top of shelves wherever I can fit them, and then I just try to work on them all at the same time so that there's a cohesive, cohesiveness to the whole body of the work as well too. Like you'll see a lot of these paintings as well too. They'll, they'll have like a black outline, and I do that as a final thing. That's my, um, I'm really happy with this, now I can move on. And it also alludes to the containment that you have within a, a comic book frame that, that holds in all the colour as well too. You just have that black outline then you move on to the next frame of the narrative. And so I don't do too many wood carvings, um, but this is one that I did probably about five or six years ago and it's based on the, um, the protagonist in the movie, the tracker Gary Sweet, and how he gets his um, justice in the end um, through all the atrocities that, that were happening within that, that narrative. Um, when, when I was working in the Kimberleys, and particularly for, for many, many, in particular for many, many years, a lot of the artists that were there uh, were in, um, I guess, in living memory of um, massacres. They were, they, were ch they were children, and some, you know, had, had witnessed these things in the Kimberleys as well too. So there are a lot of stories that were sort of really heartfelt. When I was really young, in my early twenties, um, near yeah, speaking to the old men there about things that they'd actually witnessed, it was pretty, pretty harrowing. And so I've always found that a, um, that dark history, that, that underbelly thing that sort of seemed to be glossed over until fairly recently in Australian history, um, a really fascinating source of uh, in inquiry to, to look a little bit deeper into as well too, particularly having heard stories firsthand from people. And so then it becomes a little bit more realistic than just watching a movie about it. It's, you know, when you hear it, someone actually saw that sort of stuff going on. So it's a bit of a scary piece. I personally wouldn't have it in my house. <laughs> well, um, aesthetically, um, like I, I can't help but, but see some similarities to some of the indigenous carvings from, from up north. Yeah. The, the, was that of a, an influence? Yeah, because I've seen a number of these, um, and now there's none left. That was the last one that yeah. sold, so yeah. there's none left. But yeah. um, was that an influence on you in doing, oh, doing the, these? Yeah, things? absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a great part about living in that part of North Australia is that you have exposure to all, all these different cultures. And um, so I went, I went to school with a lot of Tiwi kids. And so you watch their mum and dad sometimes, you know, Tiwi mob wouldn't necessarily just live on the islands. They'd be living in the suburbs as well too, just around Darwin. And someone would get a bit of ironwood or bloodwood when they couldn't get ironwood. They'd be carving in the back and I'll just be witnessing they're carving and the ironwood is like so difficult and so dense to carve, um, you know, hence the name, that in a way it, the material dictates the kind of forms that you can create with it rather than the other way around. You, can, you can't just go, I'm going to carve this really intricate thing out of that particular piece of timber because it's just way too difficult. And so that dictates this kind of forms that you can create with it, which is why the, the Pukamani burial poles um, are, are very much just like you know, blocks of forms. And so I, I carve in a similar manner as well too. And I've always been interested in um, sort of, I guess, the, the hierarchy of, of different kinds of arts as well too, and um, trying to bring different, I guess, uh, disciplines together and play, play around with that as well too. Um, like, you know, pa painting is seen as, as a high art, and then there's that sort of like, you know, you've got sculptures, you know, difficult to put place anywhere, and ceramics are, you know, like a, a craft, they're not really fine art and all that sort of, I try to broach all those kind of things and play around with um, my own work as well too. So sometimes I might have a show and there'll, there'll be ceramics in there, there'll be drawings that, you know, there might be a couple of photographs, there'll be some carvings, um, there'll be some things that are quite, quite fine, finely made and other things that are quite, that might look quite crude, but it's just also, as an artist as well too, trying to have, have a, just have a go, ha have a crack at everything and just see what might, what might come out, what kind of possibilities you can come up with for, um, I guess, enhancing your own visual language and your, your own experience along the way as well too. So you, you, um, you had a bit of a hiatus, you, you were showing 
um, uh, in Australia up until what, 10 or 12 years ago or something. And then um, but with Ray Hughes down in, in, in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And then that finished and you, you, you're doing your printing for about 10 years. And, and so you've only just come back to actually doing painting again. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I'm just going back to what you were saying about Wendy before where you had that major. As soon as you were back in the saddle, um, you ended up having that major retrospective um, at the museum in Darwin and, and an exhibition down at the MCA. Mm -hmm. And um, and now you've got a, a major sort of travelling exhibition coming up, which is going to start in the MT and then go. Do you want to tell people a little bit about, about what that's going to involve? Is that is that uh, like a, 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 a an exhibition of, um, of old works, or are you doing new stuff for that? I think it'll be um, a mi mixture of like older works and new works as well too. So I'll probably create a couple of new pieces for that and then try to track back over, over a period of time. And it's also with a uh, local artist, uh, Cherise Ritchie as well too. Um, so she'll be on board. She also just had, she had the last uh, retrospective at, at the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory just last year, which just wound up as well too. And we also both, the, the intersection with both of our works as well too, is we both do a lot of um, socio-political work. Uh, through our screen printing and through our printmaking practice as well too. Uh, just because it's, it's a medium that you, of course, you can create multiples and you can get information out there very, very quickly to the community um, or for, also for community-based events as well too. We're heavily involved in our community there too. So that, that was the intersection for why um, we both got chosen for that show as well too. But um, in terms of that break that I had as well too, I guess the, the GFC happened at the time and everyone just sort of like went belly up and artists and performing artists. Not unsimilar, but differently to the, what, what's happened recently with COVID with musicians and visual artists as well too. And so at the time, um, my daughter was about to, to be born as well too, Tiki. So um, I, um, I thought, what do I do now? So I just basically got into more debt and just built my studio. So I thought, I've got time off. The whole economy is collapsing around, around everyone. So I pulled more money off my mortgage and um, just started building this massive studio in the backyard. Um, and then uh, buying old bits of printing equipment from the 1800s right up to the 1950s and 60s, trucking them up to Darwin and then just fixing them, just talking to engineers or making parts myself until I got everything working again. And then started starting off the printmaking business. I was able to create multiples. So again, it's accessible. It's, um, De democratic it's uh, at a lower price point it allows you know collectors to get to get in and sort of like appreciate what what, what you do and then la later on those collectors are now um, purchasing bigger objects and paintings and stuff like that so like for those 10 years I I did that um, so but so it's really good to get back into painting again and uh, wood carving and drawing again which is great and I guess like one of the things that kick-started me off again was that show that that you organized as well too to to go to Kakadu with uh, Ewan and Steve and Peter yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> and I've known Mike for for a really long time. Um, I mean, w when I was a print, when I was um, working with a lot of Indigenous artists, printmaking, I'd, I'd often go and drop in to see Mike and just have a look and oh, what are the latest artists like? What's going on here? You know, and you know, who's a great ast artist to probably work with out on you know Gumbalanya or all that sort of stuff as well too. And Mike's always had like a really good eye. Uh, for those artists that, that are, you know, they've just got that, that special something, you know, and so I could often go there and sort of track down how to, uh, I might be able to talk to those artists as well too to get them back into the studio and uh, collaborate. Absolutely. Do you ever do any art that you keep yourself that you just can't be at a park with? I, I, I do, I have a, I have a um, I, so I built a loft in my studio when I built the studio about 10 years ago and that's just chockers full of stuff that I, I hang on to which I'm, Slowly letting Mike have a look at. Yeah. The tractor was case in point. That was the, the last one. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I took a wee bit of convincing to 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 build that one. So and then yeah. yeah. <laughs> so fingers crossed, he might do some more. Yeah. What team is that made out of? Um, that's made out of black wattle, which grows locally around Darwin. So after Cyclone Tracy, they plant the, the Darwin City Council uh, planted a lot of African mahoganies, which, which fall over during cyclones. But the black wattles are quite resilient, and they've got like a really beautiful, rich um, 
it's like a creamy timber on the outside going to a rich red brown in the middle that it's lovely timber Um, I like all sorts of things like sort of, so I might, I might attack like between, between the limbs here, I might just attack that just with, with an auger, with a hand auger. So I, I also like a lot of hand tools. I mean, I know you can, you can get away with doing things a lot quicker with the, with, um, power tools these days, but I just, I, I love the process as well too. I love the, you know, shavings, the sound that a blade makes, the, the scent of the timber, all those sorts of things. Um, it's, yeah, it's really sensory. So yeah, and like, like here I might just cut a curve here with a saw, a couple of cuts, and then I'll just cut out that chunk, just clean out big, big areas. It's pretty much just a, a, a hand saw, a couple of flat chisels and a, and a mallet, a few gouges as well too. That sort of um, translates to your paintings as well, where you don't actually frame them as such. And I know, what, do you want to talk about the process of actually making what you're going to be painting on and, and the mark making on the edges too? Because we've spoken about that before. Yeah, so, to, so for me it's just, a, the, I make the boards and they, they take a while to make as well too and I, and I stack them and I try to, you know, just really make sure that they're really seasoned. Often when, um, so I buy my timber at uh, Bunnings and um, often the timber that they sell there is still green even though it's like, it's kiln dried and everything else. So you really need to let it settle down for ages. Um, and I really like the idea I really like the idea that it's just, it's mostly the idea on the front. I'm not really worried about the side. So if I'm painting it late at night and it's in the tropics and you just get heaps of moths come through the studio or flying ants and one of them lands in the paint, you just sort of scoop it off, put it on the, on the side of the board and then keep going, flatten out that area. <laughs> you, just, you know, you just keep going. And I'm sure it's like, like that here too or in far, far north Queensland as well too with a, you know, it's, it's similar there as well too. Um, yeah. <laughs> But it, do, it doesn't, it doesn't bother, like a lot of people say, oh, you know, like that, that's the, the, you know, the, the marks of the artist and it's all part of the process. And it is for me as well too, but I really don't mind if people frame them. And I've actually seen some beautiful examples of it. When people put a frame around one of these paintings, they, they can really sing and jump off the wall as well too. I just prefer not to, yeah. And then what happens to the painting after? Um, it leaves my hands. It's some, somebody else's painting an object to look after and yeah.